Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember in these videos, I take about eight different firearms that have come into the store and give you a two to three minute review on each to give you guys an idea or a sample of some things that are out there on the market. Remember the point of this video is strictly to be educational and informative. I am not making this video to sell anything. Anyway guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, remembering the format here, we start off with the most common and then move through the least common as we progress through the video, starting off here with our number one spot. This is a Springfield Model XD, nine millimeter, first generation. Now, these have been on the market for quite some time and the history is pretty interesting. So we started in about 1990 with the PHP MV9 Croatian sidearm, which actually, uh, funny enough, was the very first video I ever did on this channel was about 10 years ago, and it was on that pistol. It was just a disassembly and reassembly. Those were imported by Century Arms back then and had not really come into the country prior to that. It's kind of a weird hybrid between a Beretta and a P38, if you go look at that, or look up a picture of a PHP MV9. Now those were not really known for their reliability. They were expensive to manufacture, they were heavy, they took a lot of uh, material, and they were made by a company called IM Metal or Metal, or however you would pronounce that, in Croatia. Um, after the Yugoslavian War, they would get into redesigning a new sidearm, same company, and they would come out with a product called the HS2000, which was essentially this first generation XD. A little bit of minor changes have been made to the to the design since then. Anyway, the pistols would start, uh, would actually become a part of the Croatian military in the year 2000, and then they would start coming into the and to the United States as surplus uh, from a company called Intrac. And actually, when these were coming in in the early 2000s, they were not very expensive, usually between about two and $300. And they were not very big sellers. Um, not a whole lot of people had a lot of interest in them. They were these weird Croatian firearms. There was, of course, a lot of stigma from the PHP MV9s. So they really didn't move around too, too well. Now about 2002, Springfield made a uh, licensing agreement with the with what the company would now be called, which is HS Product, uh, product spelled with a K. And they would of course uh, rebrand this into the XD and XD stands for Extreme Duty, Extreme Duty. So that's what XD stands for. By about 2012, these would start being a huge staple on the American uh, firearm market, probably being one of the main headliners in the polymer frame arena, uh, competing with things like the M&P line and the Glock line. Uh, so this is probably has been in the top three of the polymer frame guns for a long time. Okay, so the, again, those th top three main contenders there. Now it's funny when these were coming in as HS 2000s uh, surplus and imports. Again, they were about two to three hundred dollars and didn't move. When Springfield started releasing these into the market, they were essentially the same gun with an with a retail price of about five hundred dollars. And of course, they couldn't keep them in stock. These gained in popularity uh, greatly and have become a success story ever since with the things like the XDM and now the XD Mod 2 and then smaller variations like the XDS line XDE that have come out onto the market. So it's been a very wildly successful journey for the uh, HS2000 or the XD handgun. Also, this is a great example of branding, marketing, and advertising. How you can take something that's pretty much a brick on the water and turn it into a huge commercial success just by rebranding something and not really even having to redesign it. So, very interesting. The first generation XDs used on the market, you could pretty much find pretty inexpensively. Um, 200 to $350 respectively, depending on caliber size and what it comes with in the box. These have been and still continue to be very popular. You do have a grip safety, a, a arm striker indicator, three dot sights. Uh, they do have a pretty tall bore axis here, but um, if you if you don't mind that, if you're used to things like 1911s, you're gonna be right at home on it. But uh, anyway, these are really, really cool handguns. Love to see them come in. And they do make a great entry level or starting handgun as a used first gen XD, again, for the price point. Um, again, something that you might get new for a similar price like a Smith & Wesson uh, SD series firearm. So still a really cool option and I recommend taking a look at one if you see one. Okay, up next I have a pretty popular one. This is a Mossberg Model 535 um, all-purpose shotgun APS, I believe is the uh, 
is the acronym that they use there. Now this is pretty much a hybrid of the Model 500 series and the 835 series, so you get the name uh, 535. Now this is a three inch and three and a half inch chamber, so you do have a lot of variety in the different loads that you can use, whether it's light slugs or, or a variety of high quality buckshot. Uh, they do make these with an option of event ribbed or non-event ribbed barrels. There were some upgrades such as a double uh, action guide here on the pump. It does have the dual extractor, which you can find on the 590 series of the Mossberg. Uh, also, it has what they call the uh, anti-jam elevator here on the bottom as well. A lot of the features are going to be similar to that found on the 500, like the tang mounted safety. And it is drilled and tapped here at the top if you want to mount any type of optic. Now, this one here is missing its choke, but of course, just use no box, anything like that. Um, again, for the money, brand new, these are in about the five to $600 range, so about what you're gonna pay for a Model 500. Uh, use, just like 500s, they don't really keep a huge amount of their value. Typically, anywhere from two to $300 is where you're gonna find these. So if you are looking for something that has a lot of uh, durability and something that you can use for many different purposes or genres of hunting or field use, uh, the 535 is actually a really good option. So really, you can break it down to any type of different um, uh, practicums that you wanted to cover, whether you're doing turkey or deer hunting or anything like that. So a uh, really, really nice all around multi-purpose shotgun. Not much else to say about it. If you do see one, definitely take a look. Again, if you can find it in that price point between two and 300 used, uh, definitely won't go wrong with something like this. So Mossberg 535. Okay, up next, I have a pretty popular one. This is a Ruger Security 9. Let me pull this out of here. And this particular one is fitted with the laser. So this was a factory option. There you go. Okay, so the Security 9 would have come out from Ruger, Ruger in 2017 and would actually come on pretty close to the launch of the American series. The American series would replace the SR series, which is one thing that I never liked. I really was a big fan of the SR series. Now this was not really meant to be in their main service uh, size or, or service offering. Again, that was more to be the American. This is more of an entry level economic option for people who are getting into shooting and they wanted to basically capture it on the market of those people looking to come in to spend about the 300 to $400 on their first firearm, which of course is where the market was on this. Sort of like where the um, uh, SD9VE is with the Smith & Wesson lineup. Still a quality firearm from a good manufacturer, but not quite up in like the M&P line or in Ruger's case, the American line for service use. Now, if you basically look at this, the stylizing is very similar to the LCP2. In fact, basically it is an LCP2 that has been scaled up for nine millimeter. So like the LCP2, it is a hammer fired. It's actually an internal hammer right here, single action only. Uh, firearm. There is a U-dot sight configuration similar to what you're going to find on a Glock. There is nothing like interchangeable back straps. The magazine release is reversible. It does have a section of 1913 rail. Of course, you have very wide serrations here like you're going to find on the EC9S and just a black oxide finish. Again, these are cost-saving measures. The grip texture is nice and simple, very narrow, especially somebody like me who has uh, smaller hands. This, this is very comfortable for me, and it does have a trigger safety here. So you do get a lot of features, and they are very reliable handguns, uh, again, for the money, and they have been a very popular offering from Ruger. In fact, actually, we sell a lot more of these than we do the American. Uh, we carry more of these than we do the American series gun. I just haven't seen a lot of popularity in those. So this is sort of taking over, in my opinion, as like the full-size uh, handgun from Ruger. It's, I feel more people are buying these and actually carrying them and using them for uh, security. Actually, we have a guy who's a security guy who uh, bought one of these from us and uses it, uh, works at a pharmaceutical company near us. So uh, he definitely likes it and it works well for him. Uh, really, really nice firearm. Manual safety here as well. Again, the price point on these brand new isn't very high. Under normal circumstances, you're at about 350 to 400 new used. You should be at about between two and three hundred dollars of course right now prices are elevated especially on affordable options like this so right now you are seeing the prices on something like this with a laser for maybe about the 350 dollar price point because you know everything's elevated by about 100 to 200 dollars right now and just about everything so um side note on this on some of my previous videos and people have been sort of 
calling me a scam artist or whatever, talking about the pricing on guns. Keep in mind, guys, I'm not giving you these prices as like a hidden wink or a nod to tell you that like this is what I'm selling them to you for. I am just informing you guys of where the market is, okay? I don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings, but if you go on Gun Broker or any other national sites where these are actually selling, not people just listing them for sale, that's what people are actually paying for things right now, which is where I give you these price points. So again, I'm just trying to inform you guys of the market, nothing else. So uh, take that for what you will. I just wanted to throw that in there. I know most of you guys get that, but still, I just wanted to throw that in there for you. Anyway, if you guys see a Security 9 new or used and you haven't yet had the chance to look at one, I definitely recommend it, especially again, if you're looking for that entry level gun, it should be one that you should include as a, a potential uh, possibility for that role in your lineup. All right, up next, this is actually one of my favorites. This is a Ruger SP-101. Traditionally, you find these chambered in 357, but they did also make them in 327 Federal, 38 Special, 9mm, 22 Long Rifle, and 32 h and R. Of course, in the higher calibers like 357, 9, and 38, you're on a five round cylinder. 327 Federal uh, is, I believe, a six, and then in 22, it's an eight round cylinder. So there are different options there. Also, uh, you do have different barrel lengths and they do have the stainless and then the blue. Okay, this is a full steel construction and actually a very heavy firearm for what it is. Again, it was meant to be the small concealable version of the GP100, which is its larger frame counterpart. Now these do balance very, very nicely. You do have double single action. They do have a uh, one with a bob hammer or hammerless version. Um, and there is a transfer bar for safety. Now this would hit the market in 1989 and has actually been a staple for Ruger's lineup for quite some time. Uh, of course, having been produced from 1989 to today, so it's still a very popular option. Now, brand new, you're gonna find these retailing in about the five to $600 mark used under normal circumstances. You're usually around the $400 mark. Of course, again, prices being elevated due to the shortage on firearms, you're typically, again, about 500 plus uh, on a used one at the moment. Of course, if you wanna wait it out, those prices will surely come down when everything is back and supply is back to normal. And Anyway, due to their durability, ruggedness, their nice aesthetic looks, uh, and the price point, these have actually been really good sellers in our store. We always keep them in stock, and if we get them in use, they are pretty fast movers. Uh, something like this, great as a glove box gun, or actually taking like on a, as a camping gun, uh, just due to its uh, durability and robustness. Now, that heavy weight can be a deterrent to most people, but keep in mind, in 357, that heft and that weight is actually going to help you dampen down the recoil. So, uh, actually, something that I I may recommend for a first time shooter or even whether it's for concealed carry or for home defense. So just a really good option. I recommend you take a look. All right, up next is another SIG P320. Now I know I had one of these on last week's weekly used gun review, but this one's different enough. Uh, to where I wanted to bring this one out here for you. Now this is a used firearm, of course, as all of these are, but it is pretty much new and the, the basically what happened is the previous owner was looking for the X carry model, uh, couldn't find one, of course, because everything's crazy right now, ended up settling on a new compact with the cutout and the Romeo 1 uh, optic on here, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, and then ended up buying it. And while it was in transit, a website notified him that the X carry had come in stock and he bought it and of course didn't need to. So he sold this one. And because it was actually uh, transferred and taken home by the customer, it's now considered used, even though it's not been fired or anything like that, but we would sell, still sell it as used. And these use, you know, about probably 800 right now with the optic. Um, new, I know for a fact, uh, he said they were going for about 950. So that just gives you an interesting idea of where the times are on things like this. Now, as I mentioned, this is a SIG P320. One of the things that makes this interesting is the modularity. Again, I went over this in last week's video. You can take out the trigger group, put it into different size frames, and uh, you know, like that one was the full length slide with the full length grip. This gives you an idea of the a medium sized frame module. This is sort of the compact size, if you will. So you can mix and match different things to fit in different ways. Now this one was milled for an optic, which the other one was not. So you could put the Romeo one. The Romeo one, of course, is a sick optic for their different series of handguns that, that fit optics on it. Now the optics themselves are typically a couple hundred dollars, so they're not overly expensive. And just a nice option if you do have problems with visibility, eyesight, or if you do want that extra edge in competition, the uh, optics, especially probably in about the last seven or eight years have started becoming incredibly popular and every major manufacturer has a optics ready uh, handgun somewhere in their lineup everywhere from Glock to XD to M&P to SIG to you know everything so um, 
definitely a normal thing you're going to find now. Now, I personally haven't had an interest in optics or anything like that. I'm more of a bare bones stock, basic sight type of person, especially for carry. I would never carry with an optics, just more to think about, more that can break and a little bit bulkiness. Uh, again, some people will use them for home defense and mostly where you're gonna see stuff like this show up is in competition. Now, again, remember the P320 did uh, get selected by the US military as part of the XM17 handgun trials and is now the model M17 which looks quite a bit different than this, but um, it is a popular design. It has been around for a little while. Again, if you remember the 250, it's basically the hammer-fired version of this. So uh, P320s. One other point to note as a difference between that one versus this one is that one had the old uh, unupgraded trigger that I told you guys about, the drop safety issues. Uh, this one has its newer trigger. So you can kind of see that if you want to refer back to that video and look at this one. Uh, that's how you can quickly tell that it is the newer updated drop safe trigger. It's kind of the skinnier profile there. So one other point of note for you guys. Again, if you see one, definitely worth taking a look at. Okay, up next is a personal favorite of mine. And many of you guys know I am a huge World War II buff as well as military surplus collector so i love seeing stuff like this come in this is a world war ii japanese type 99 arasaka chambered for 7.7 .7 jap or jap as uh, is as the round is known uh, basically, they had gone to the Type 99 Arasaka from the Type 38. The Type 38 was much longer and was also chambered in the 6.5. The 6.5 was a more, much more anemic round, and of course, in many countries, especially, you know, we're talking about Italy was moving from the 6.5 to the 7.35. And of course, you have Japan moving from the 6.5 to the 7.7, so everybody's getting into a more um, uh, full-size, full-powered rifle cartridge with just a little bit more velocity, accuracy, and lethality. Also, the 6.5 was a rounded, uh, rounded projectile, whereas the 7.7 was a spitzer or a pointed bullet, again, helping with aerodynamics, velocity, things like that. This was a five round capacity internal box magazine bolt action rifle. It was actually known to be one of the most robust actions of the war up there with Mauser designs. Of course, Cox on clothes. Now, this particular one was likely a vet bring back because there was no importation marks. Uh, the bolt itself is totally mismatched to the action, and it looks like the finish was parkerized and the uh, stock itself was refinished. Um, now, you typically would have found a bunch of gadgets and doodads on these Type 99s, including a uh, monopod, which this one is lacking, anti-aircraft sights, which this one is lacking, a dust cover, which this one does not have. Um, and that's basically it. It was very typical that the Japanese themselves would get rid of all of that stuff because it did not really add a whole lot of value to the rifle in terms of, you know, its usefulness in the field. Uh, the dust cover was known to rattle. The monopod would get stuck on vegetation and things as you were uh, patrolling through the, the deep and uh, thick jungles and vegetation. And the anti-aircraft sights, let's face it, it was not going to be very likely that you're go going to shoot down an aircraft with your bolt action rifle. So a lot of those were ditched and actually in later production, they were just left off the rifles entirely. One other interesting note is the chrysanthemum. The chrysanthemum is, you guys, I don't know if you can tell too well, I'll bring that in for you, it is located right there. And as you guys can see, it is pretty well intact. It's basically like a flower looking emblem. That is the property marking of Emperor Hirohito, which basically said anything bearing that mark or that crest was his property. Now, after the surrender of Japan, 1945, uh, MacArthur, uh, ordered actually under the request of Harihito in the terms of the surrender of Japan that that marking on any of the emperor's property or military equipment bearing that mark had to be removed either by the Japanese soldier that was re that was relinquishing the rifle or the American soldier that was taking it home as a war trophy. MacArthur agreed and ordered that anybody in possession of Japanese equipment uh, or firearms bearing that mark would deface it. You know, typically they would take their bayonet and strike through it or, or grind it off somehow. And that was basically to say, any you know, once that mark is removed, it's no longer his property and he didn't want his property to be in the, the possession of the lowly American GIs or anybody else that would be taking these home as war trophies. Now, one other thing that was typical of bring backs is to find a matching action, but a mismatched bolt, which this is the case, where the bolt is matching to itself, but the action is is a number differently, but the parts on the barrel and the, and the receiver and everything are matching. Basically what they would do is when these were 
surrender, they would just remove the bolt and throw all the bolts in one pile and the rest of the guns in another pile. And then when American troops would pick these up and take them home as war trophies, they would grab one action and one bolt. They didn't care if it matched or not and stick the bolt back in the gun and then take it home. So that was typical of German Mausers that were brought home too, you, where you have an all matching gun but a different matching bolt, but the bolt matching to itself. That's typically the reason for that. Now, pricing on these is all over the board. It depends on condition, matching numbers, if all those original parts are there in the series, or you know the, the lot in which it was manufactured, which typically the series denotes different years, of, not really years of production, but different for different runs of production, which gives you an idea of about during the war uh, when it was made, if you will. In a condition like this, uh, pretty low, I mean, two to $300. Um, a standard Type 99 can get up to probably about seven, 800 is the max. If it's all authentic, a Series 1 or a Series 2 uh, with bipod, with anti-aircraft slides, with dust cover, um, all correct. With the chrysanthemum not scrub, that would be your perfect uh, unupgradable version. That would probably top out at about nine. But this refinished, mismatched, uh, without all the spare parts on it, probably two to 300 bucks. Not a really lot of shooting ability in this as the 7.7 is very expensive and hard to find. Typically you're at about $2 a round when you can find it. So people don't really buy these as shooters, although they are good shooters. People typically just buy them to collect. But anyway, love seeing these things come in and there's that one for you. Okay, up next is another personal favorite of mine. This is a German Mauser K98K, K standing for Kurtz. Eight millimeter Mauser bolt action, five round internal magazine. Okay, this is what you would call an RC or Russian capture. And as far as collecting here in the United States goes, these would be at the bottom of the totem pole. When Germany surrendered in 1945, they relinquished their arms to two major countries, the Russians and the Americans. Now, I know the British were there as well, but as far as American collecting goes, we don't see a lot of British uh, bring back firearms as we are not in the UK. So as far as collecting goes, you have your uh, full bring back non-import marked ones, and then you have the Russian capture ones. So, Basically, the process would go as follows, that when they surrender to Americans, just like I talked about with the Arasakas, you pull out the bolt, you throw the bolts in one pile, you throw the actions in another, and then the GIs go pick them up, put them back together, and bring them home. You usually had a mismatched bolt, and, a, and a, a, well, the bolt would be matching to itself, but the bolt assembly would not be matching the gun, and the rifle, the stock, and everything would be matching to itself. Um, that's typically how you find a lot of bringbacks. Now you can find K98 bringbacks that were 100% matching, and in typically those cases, those guns were likely just brought home or picked up um, on the field, not picked up from the, the arms piles at the end of the war. So that makes those the most rare to find and of course the most expensive. Now, when they surrendered to Russia, what the Russians typically did is they disassembled and dismantled every single part of the firearm. They would disassemble the bolt, the floor plate, the sight, pull the stock out, and then they would throw everything in different piles where they would sit in Russian warehouses. Uh, they were dipped in a sort of a very blackish type paint finish. Uh, the stocks were typically lacquered. And then they were stuck in warehouses in case Russia ever ended up in another war, they could quickly reassemble them and put them into service as ancillary rifles. Well, as the 90s specifically would approach, uh, American importers would go to Russia and they would say, hey, you guys have these stockpiles of these Mausers you're obviously not using. And American importers bought up a ton of them. What they would do is they would, you know, in Russia, they would go into the warehouses, they would pull out a stock and a bolt and a barrel and a trigger group assembly, a floor plate, a rear sight, and they would just put everything back together. Of course, they didn't care about matching parts because they didn't really care about the collectability. These are just used to be shooters. Then they would take somebody, would sit there with an electric pencil, and they would look at the serial number on the receiver, and they would call what's called force match uh, all the small parts. You see electric penciling on small parts to match the serial number on the receiver. Um, then they would you know, ship them off to the United States where they would come in as uh, imports, and it would be import marked here, and then sold to American collectors, shooters, and enthusiasts as, again, Russian capture shooter quality rifles. And typically when these were coming in in the 90s and 2000s, they were anywhere from 200 to $300 all day long. It was typical you would find them without the cleaning rod, no sight hoods, and they would basically be in about this, con this condition. Now, interestingly enough, Russian captures are getting very expensive. It has nothing to do with the times right now. These have been creeping up to six, seven, $800 for Russian capture mismatch refurbs, which is 
what you used to be able to find a bring back for. Uh, now the all matching bring backs are up to two and three thousand, and then the partially mismatched bring backs with no import marks with a mismatched bolt, for example, might be about fifteen hundred. So of course, like everything else, as the interest in World War II stuff has been increasing over the years with movies and video games and everything, so too have the prices on things like this. This is absolutely just a shooter grade K98, but again, you know, I'd expect it to go between five and seven hundred dollars in this current market, which is to me just seems crazy, but it is what it is, and it is still an actual World War II German K98. Uh, it's not a Yugoslavian or a Chinese, or not Chinese, I'm sorry, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, or anything like that. It is German from World War II with all of its Waffen amps and everything on it. So there is that. Anyway, if you are looking for a shooter, you don't want anything super collectible, but you do want an, an authentic World War II German Mauser in its German configuration, uh, this is definitely the option for you. But anyway, Definitely worth taking a look at, and they're fun to shoot at the range. Okay, last but not least is actually one that we've never had in here, new or used. This is a Smith & Wesson Performance Center 929 revolver, 9 millimeter, 6.5 inch barrel, 8 round capacity, and this is an end frame, and it is a titanium alloy. It does come with two different interchangeable muzzle brakes that you can put on there to lighten up your recoil or whatever you want to do. A Hogue uh, rubberized grips with the finger grooves, double single action with an exposed hammer, and there is a trigger bar. And the action on this is actually really smooth. Unfortunately, there is a frame lock, and uh, apparently you can somehow mount an illuminated optic on here. I don't know what the mounting system is. This is popularized, popularized by Jerry Michelek. He has a video with an illuminated optic on it, which he famously shoots a balloon at a thousand yards with this firearm. This was sort of the brainchild of Jerry Michelek and Smith & Wesson to come up with a sort of end-all be-all competition 9mm revolver. So where you're going to mainly find this is in competition circuits, as well as enthusiast shooting. Uh, I guess you could do hunting, small game hunting with this if you wanted to in a 9mm, but that's not really its intended purpose. Adjustable rear sight, really nice tall front blade. Uh, for the size, very, very lightweight and a good ergonomic, very nicely balanced revolver. I mean, honestly, picking it up, you kind of look at it and it's almost like in the realm of like a 500 Smith & Wesson or maybe a model uh, 29 in terms of, of size and form. And you, you get quite a bit less weight. It is still heavy, obviously, uh, with that huge, you know, six and a half inch barrel with the compensator there at the end. But really for what it is, it's a really nice balance and weight to it. Really nice trigger pull, smooth travel, really, really clean break, really light. So just a nice, I mean, definitely I could see performance in our shop written all over this. Now it does have the Jerry Michelek uh, name scribed right there. Now brand new, these are an MSRP of about $1,200. And right now, of course, that's about where you're finding them new, used right between 900 and 1,000. Again, the times are what the times are. Stuff like this isn't really affected too much by the pricing of what's going on right now. It's more the, uh, the uh, what I want to say, the polymer frame, entry level and mid range defensive firearms that are kind of exploding in price right now. Uh, but these, of course, are still elevated right now with the times. Again, if you check gun broker pricing, that's about where these are laying out is uh, 900 to 1000 used. Um, if you're looking for a competition 9mm revolver or you just want something that's really cool and different to take out to the range, this is a cool option. Again, I've never actually seen one before in person, so uh, happy to get a chance to take a look at this. So, uh, anyway, if that's your uh, sort of area that's a niche that you like to be in as far as a, a, a being a firearms enthusiast something definitely worth taking a look at well that is all the time i have for you today on these thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video if you enjoyed please let me know by hitting the like button and if you want to see more videos like this remember we upload these weekly used gun reviews every single week so make sure to hit that subscribe button and bell no notification button so you are aware when i am posting these videos anyway guys i'm going to leave you off there i am chris with marksman shooting sports in westfield indiana you are watching marksman tv and i will see you guys next time